Sorry about that last joke. When I got here, Jordan was like, well, Rich, we need to know something really embarrassing about you. I'm like, why? So I can tell everyone before you give your speech. I don't know why. But. So as you heard, I'm an online community consultant, and that's something I've been doing for about 10 years now, on and off at different times. And during that time, as you've heard, I've worked with a number of different clients. And throughout all that time, there's one client that I want to tell you about today that has really stood out for me more than any other client. And it's a client I had about two years ago, which I can't mention by name, as you'll find out uh, very soon. And it's a client that about a third of the people in this room probably have bought something from in the last year or so. And so it began about two years ago. Um, I received a call from the European marketing manager at a very, a very big company. And he was really worried about um, his online community efforts. So he had spent a lot of time and money trying to get their community off the ground. He had gotten a lot of people to join the community. He had tried his best to get the discussions flowing. And it just wasn't taken off. It just wasn't happening. And that's a very common problem that a lot of brands had. So we agreed to rate, and I flew out there. And it was into a European capital. And I meet him and his team, and go into a big room, and he starts telling me about everything that he's been doing in his online community so far. And he's telling me that he, you know, he's tried really hard to get people to participate. He's had competitions, challenges, and he's getting really worried now. He's really, he spent half his budget already, and he's really starting to panic that the community might not take off. And so, which begs the question: What is your budget? Which is something I now will ask before I agree to rate. And well, let me ask you, how many of you think you can build a online community in, say, £50,000 or less? Just one of you? Two? How many of you think you need fifty to 100000 How many think you need one hundred to 500000 How many do you think you need more than that? So those are the answers that I would generally expect, and there isn't really a fixed answer, it depends very much upon your staffing cost and etc. But imagine my surprise when this guy told me that the budget for his online community, all the money that he had to spend on the staffing and the technology and the platform and all that, came to a grand total of four million dollars. Now, this is why you always ask what the budget is before you agree your fee, probably. So, so. But also, I mean, this was $4 million. If I had added up the budgets of all the clients that I've worked with since then, I'm not sure that would come to $4 million. And this was $4 million during the middle of a recession. So, I mean, how do you get $4 million? I mean, it's going kind of, kind of to be like the Jedi master of internal negotiations, you know? But what the more interesting question is, is not how he got $4 million, but how do you, but how do you spend $4 million? He would have spent half it. Where did that $2 million go? So I obviously asked him, how, much, how, how did you spend this much money already? And he was very generous and kind to break down his budget. And it went something like this. Um, he had spent a very high six-figure sum developing the community platform. So they had built the entire platform from scratch. They had um, developed the whole sort of coding. It looked like Facebook, but with lots of other features from different platforms. It's like they had pinched all the features they liked from all the other social platforms and developed into one platform that could do literally anything. It had every feature their members would never use. <laughs> they had also um, hired a staff of, I think, it's like four or five people. Uh, two of them were former journalists. And these were the people that would be creating content for the community. They'd be getting the latest news. They'd be writing about it first. They'd be making sure that there's always fresh stuff that people would go and visit on that. It had uh, two or three community managers. Um, this is before they got any members to join, by the way. Um, what else they have? They hired a PR company, a very well-known PR company in London to promote the community. And one of the things they did is had a big uh, competition, which has got lots of people to join. They issued press releases. They did everything that PR companies tend to do quite well. Um, and my favorite one, they had spent about $90,000 on legal fees, which is, which is interesting because most uh, communities spend money on legal fees after they've been sued. You know? So how do you spend $90,000 before the community's launched? Well, it's on a 91-page terms and conditions for joining the online community platform. I mean, what most people do is that they just steal what someone else has if they're right, that worked for you, it's probably going to work for me, just change names. But no, they did it all from scratch. And the whole budget was just insane. And I tell you a story, not to make fun of them, but because the way they approach online communities is the way that most brands approach online communities. Most brands have no frame of reference for developing an online community. Most brands, nothing that they've done in the past has prepared them for developing an online community today. 
and they need to radically rethink how they approach online communities. They need to understand that an online community is a very unique field within other social um, fields, such as social media and building up an audience and online customer service. And developing an online community is quite unique, and it takes a different approach, and it means they have to adjust and understand what that approach is. And I think, fundamentally, they need to understand what a community is. I mean, they really need to understand that, how it works, what the genuine benefits of it. And that's the question I want to begin with today. Like, what is a community? What makes a community unique from other social fields? What, what's true offline that will work on, online as well? So I want to ask that question to you guys now. Um, you can shout the answers, raise your hands, or throw things, whatever. What do you think is a community? Anyone? Shared interest. Shared interest? Anyone else? If no one shouts anything out, I'm going to start picking them. Group of people? Group of people? Anyone else? Common values. Common values? And that's kind of the answers that you t tend, tend to get. I mean, what I was hoping would happen is that you'd all give different definitions so I can move on to my next point. Which is generally that people have very different, diff de very different definitions of what a community is. And even at a very academic level, there isn't a common understanding of what a community is. And even if you forget about the internet, the only thing that makes the internet different is that instead of people using the miracle of their tongues to communicate, they use the miracle of the internet. And so people have to understand that community is very different and it, requ and it requires a very different approach. And what you generally find in the definitions that academics give about the community is that it usually includes three things, a, a specific group of um, individuals, a strong shared interest, and relationships. And this is kind of, it makes it seem like the community is a very broad thing. But when you actually apply this, it excludes a lot of the things that we tend to consider our communities. It excludes a lot of the Facebook um, pages and Twitter followings because they don't have all three. So I'm going to begin with a specific group of people and what we mean when we say a specific group of people. An online community isn't an inclusive term. It's not about getting as many people as possible to join it. It's an exclusive term. It's about taking a very specific group of individuals and building up a strong sense of community between them. And so what that means is that a community, people that are in the community have crossed some sort of boundary. And the boundary is what separates members from non-members. It's what, if you cross the boundary, then people will accept you as a member of the community. It's the difference between moving to an area and being accepted as a community because you've participated, you've built friends, you've built relationships, and you've spent a lot of time doing that. And a boundary is very important because it is a, it's, it's the single thing that members can use to identify who is and isn't a member. And you have to think that any online community you can think of today, any community possible you can think of today, has, a, has some sort of boundary that people have to, to cross. So how many of you have heard of um, Mumsnet, for example? Most of you. So Mumsnet is a good example because most people have heard of it. It's a community for mums in the UK. And it's been going for a while and it's been quite popular. But what do you think the boundary is for that? The boundary for Mumsnet is that you have to be a mum for starters. And that's a tough boundary because you have to be... You have to go gone through the apparent hell of pregnancy and raising a child. You also have to understand like technology to use the internet. And generally, people mums that have more progressive values than mums in the past. And that's a boundary that they've crossed to become accepted as members of mums there. And every online community has that sort of boundary. Any community you can think of is it has that, that sort of boundary that is defined by their um, experiences that people have had in the past, by the things they've achieved, by the skills they've gained, by um, situations that they've been through together. And the tougher the boundary is, the stronger the sense of community. So if a boundary is really tough to cross, if, you've had, if it's a really hard experience to gain, if it's a really hard skill to master, then the sense of the community between the people that have gone through that is stronger than uh, communities that have a very weak boundary. So next we're going to come to the strong interest. So there's a difference between a strong interest and a boundary. A boundary is what people have had to go through or is uh, qualified for, for selecting that specific group of people. And by the way, you get to set what the boundary is. If you're running a community for a brand, you get to determine how high or weak you make that boundary. And it's a trade-off between how many members you want depending on how strong you want the community to be. So a strong interest, there are broadly five different types of, five different categories of interest that we're concerned with here. So you get a lot of uh, communities of place, which, is, which are communities that are bound by some sort of geographical location. You get uh, communities of practice, which are people that undertake the same activities together. Very commonly here, you'll get a community of profession, 
a lot of you guys are probably uh, social media specialists or some sort of social me media roles, I'd imagine. Um, you get a community of interest, uh, people that have the same passions, the same um, sort of television shows and topics and things like that. Uh, community of action, pe people want to change things in the world. And community of circumstance, uh, people that have had a situation uh, put upon them, um, not always by, by choice. Um, you get a lot of health uh, communities in this category. So one mistake that a lot of brands make here is that they assume that the community has to be a community of interest. They assume that the brand is the interest and the community has to be about it. But interest is the hardest category to build a community for. And very few brands succeed in doing it, as we will find out in a minute. And it's much easier to take a community of individuals that have a common boundary and, and put it into a different interest. So like a community of action or a community of practice, and you can add that extra qualifier, an extra layer to it. And you're more likely to make your community stand out, and you're more likely to be able to, to, to develop a successful online community as a result of that. And finally, we have relationships. And relationships is generally what separates a community from the social media audiences that a lot of brands tend to have. So it's not that difficult to build up a big, a big audience for a brand. It's not that difficult to get a lot of people to like you on Facebook or Twitter. And that's, well, that's the audience interacting with you. A community is an audience interacting with, with each other. And that's a very different skill set. It's a very different approach that you need to take for that. And you need, your, you need people in that community to develop relationships with each other. That's where the sense of community comes from. So relationships, um, and I'll go through this quickly, because uh, it's basically three things. So you have the interaction. This is the very basic level of um, relationships. You can't have relationships in your community if people aren't interacting with each other. The very basic thing you need to be doing in any community is getting people to interact with each other. That means, as we'll find out in a minute, asking questions, um, introducing them to each other, and doing all those sorts of activities that are going to cause these people to interact. Next, you need disclosure. It's not enough just to interact. The people need to be revealing information about themselves, their thoughts and feelings and issues, the experiences that they've had in the past. They have to be, it's a reciprocal disclosure where people, if I reveal something, then you reveal something, and the, and a level of trust develops upon that. And you, you can do this in any online community. You can develop, um, you can have the interactions, you can do a lot of things that are going to cause people to interact. You can have discussions on topics that are going to be able to make people disclose more information, their thoughts and feelings about themselves on it. And as a result, you get trust, which is the relationships. So just to highlight the example, this is a fan page for Coco. It's the first one I found, um, just to highlight the difference between a a social media audience and an online community. So most of you have probably seen this page before, and I came across it because I've been hearing for a long time that Coca-Cola has a very good online community, and I, I disagree. I think they have a very big audience. I don't think they have a community in the traditional sense. So you see the Coca-Cola page, and they've got 33 million people on it, and you won't be able to see it. So basically, when you actually drill down into what people are doing there, are they talking to each other? Are they interacting? Are they building relationships with, with each other? Not a chance. They're mostly just talking gibberish or making single statements or otherwise not doing anything that in any way constitutes a community. These people aren't really building relationships with each other. They're just, well, from the looks of this one, just making random comments. But generally, they're not really interacting with each other. So they have no sense of community there whatsoever. And so what Coco are doing, doing is building a big audience, which is fine. There's lots of benefits to building a big audience if you want to... Uh, promote something or raise awareness, then building a big audience is perfectly fine. But a community is a different tool and has a different use. Now, um, the final thing, a community isn't a binary value. It's not either it is, a, it is a community or it isn't. A community is more of a continuum. There's a range of levels that community can be on. And it makes it a little bit more complicated because the strength of the relationship, how strong the community is. But it's not a binary integer. It's not either yes, it's community or no, it's not. It's a bigger range and more complicated than that. So, which begs the question, that's great, but how do you actually do it? How do you actually build the online community? So I'm going to go, go through these as quickly as possible. So first, you look for a strong interest, and we covered this very briefly in the past, but the common misconception with brands is that they try to make their community about themselves. They try to make their community about the brand. But very few brands are interested in their community around. And if you look for examples of brands that have a genuine community around what they do, it's actually a very small number. The common misconception that brands have is that just because people purchase from them, that, that 
people want to spend their spare time talking about them and participating in a community about them. And that's almost never true. If you want to spend your time participating in a community about toothpaste, and so what's the solution then? If you do sell toothpaste, how do you develop a community around that? The answer is you have to be, you have to make a community that's about that interest, that broader interest, that thing that your product or service actually solves in the world. It's some a thing that is going to help you develop um, a sense of united by. It. So toothpaste, for example, you might build a community that have a particular issue with their teeth. You might build a community of people that have some sort of heightened interest in dental cleanliness or some sort of bathroom-related community in Thailand. But you, uh, the most successful communities tend to be brand agnostic. And it's a lot easier for brands to build a successful community if their community isn't about that. And it's much more successful. And you will we'll see that most of the brands that, su that succeed in building an online community are brand agnostic communities. Oh, this is one of my favorite examples of an online community of all time. And it was when Coca-Cola started their community about Sprite. And I was so disappointed that they took this um, online community down just before I could get a screenshot of it, because it was amazing. Um, so they started an online community called The Yard. Um, and luckily, I could find the press release, because this is just fantastic. <coughs> this is the press release, a snippet of the press release. The Coca-Cola company is redefining the relationship between consumers and their sparkling beverages. With the launch of the Sprite Yard, a real-time digital on-the-go community that provides social connections and downloadable content via their mobile phone anytime, anywhere. Isn't that fantastic? How many of you have a relationship with your sparkling beverage? <laughs> Anyone? Generally, I mean, this is a humorous example, but it is a far away from what, from what most brands try to do. They try to build a community about products or services that people might buy and they might like interesting to spend their spare time participating in a community about it. And there were a number of things that Coca-Cola perhaps could build a community around, and they're starting to do it a little bit with their happiness um, products now. But I mean, you see brands doing it again and again, building a community about, about themselves, a, a community that's named after them, and thinking that all these people that purchase from them want to spend their spare time participating in a community about them. It's much easier to focus on that interest that people have. And, then, and these interests, as you'll generally find, will be, will be things that we spend a lot of time on, a lot of money emotionally invested in. Those are generally the three. And if we don't spend a lot of time on it, if we don't spend a lot of money on it, and we don't, I mean, if we're not emotionally invested in it, then it's much harder to build a community around it. Oh, this was another example from British Airways. Well, this actually wasn't a bad idea. They didn't build a community about them. They built a community called Metro Twig. Although I asked, none of you were involved in second sub in suffering. Because I did talk a while ago and one of kept away. Um, and so this is a community by British Airways for people that travel between New York and London quite often. And so they can share their, their tips and advice and they can say, if you like this place in London, then you'll love this place in New York. But it failed because their audience, even though the idea was better than what most ideas are, their audience doesn't want to spend, their busy audience doesn't want to spend their spare time participating in a community like this. Now, there might be a case for a community with people that do travel quite often, or business travelers, and it's some sort of exclusive group. There might have been a possibility for a community there. But a community just about this just wouldn't work. So the next step is to use simple technology. Another thing that, that brands tend to do so often is, is create a bespoke community platform from scratch. And it's a really big mistake to make because the technology should be as simple as possible. It helps if your audience lose their technology to travel. And you'll find that most of the successful online communities that you see today are built using the simplest software possible. And I'll show you an example of this in a second. But forums and mailing lists are still working fine for dozens of online communities. Sorry, millions of online communities. And, and you shouldn't be very in innovative in how people can interact with each other. You, sh you shouldn't try to push the envelope. You should keep the, le the tool that people use to interact with each other as simple as possible. And most brands, they spend ages building a branded community, and they'll spend a high sum, and I've seen sums of six figures. I heard that Metro Twin site was a million. It's just insane how much money brands spend building their community platform. Doesn't it make more sense to invest more money in the community platform as the community grows, at least? And a lot of brands, they tend to spend so much money building this platform and then hoping that it takes off. That's a big risk. 
you can grow your platform with the community itself. You can invest more as the community grows. You don't need to take this massive risk straight, straight away and hope that it pays off. And this is an example I love. It's one of my favorite online communities. It's called Backyard Chickens. Um, and it is the ugliest online com community I've ever found. I mean, you can check it out on your iPhones or laptops or whatever. But it, it's horrific. It's like 1997 rejected it and just stayed that way. Um, really, I mean, it's got different windows. It's, it's, it, it's a mess. However, this Backyard Chickens community platform has 102,000 members. You can look this up, I'm not making this up. It's had 538,000 topics. And my favorite, it's got 6.7 million posts and counting. 6.7 million. This is the kind of community that brands are, you know, eat their interns to get. I mean, it, it's an insanely popular community. But brands, they tend to ignore this sort of approach. They tend to love being in meetings where I've shown them example after example of communities like this that have been that succeeded, that are thriving. But brands still insist on building a community that's branded in, in their manner, uses the latest technology, but if you actually look into how many community platforms use the latest technology, it's not very many. Most of the successful community platforms we see today are platforms that are being built in technology that people are really used to, people are very familiar <coughs> with. Um, this is a community by um, Mercedes-Benz. And I love generation bands because whenever I need an example of what not to do, I just look at what they're doing. <laughs> you should sign up for the site. You've got like five pages of registration to go, to go through. It's fantastic. So they built their community um, in, in Flash, so you probably can't access it. <laughs> um, I've, been, I've, been, I've been told they spent a couple of million on this, actually. Um, and it's a community for people that might buy a Mercedes Benz in the future. Why don't I break that? Um, I've been told it's a community of people that will buy Mercedes-Benz in the future. So it's flash, it's, they spent a lot of money, it's, it's, it's supposedly very, very well designed. But the actual community itself, I mean, it's not going to work. People don't know how to use it. They, and that boundary, that, that time it takes to learn how to use it, people just can't be bothered. People would rather drift away, and, it, and they need something that's simpler than that. They need something that they, need, they know how to use straight away. And going to a community, there's a perhaps subconscious level of social risk there, that you're going to make a mistake, that you're going to do something wrong and the community will reject you. You don't need to add to that by adding some unfamiliar platform. Um, this is another co uh, commun uh, community by Virgin Media and Enterprise UK. There's no one here that works for them, right? <coughs> Great. Um, so Virgin Media pioneers, they tried to do something in, um, very in innovative as well. And they decide that if people are going to interact, they're going to record videos of themselves. This is like um, teenagers, like 12 to 19 or so. They're going to um, record videos of themselves and then upload those, those videos onto the internet. That's how they can talk to each other. Well, that's stupid. I mean, <laughs> so do you think people aren't going to spend the time you know, recording a video of themselves and then uploading it just so they can talk to each other? Especially in the age of Facebook and forums and all the other tools that are much quicker and much easier than that. You should, you should try to be very innovative about the platform itself. The platform should be as simple as possible. Oh, this is another mistake that brands tend to make very often, is that when they're developing their bespoke, custom, expensive uh, online community platform, is that they'll try and make it look the way that any marketing activity should look. So what they'll do is that they'll have some sort of big uh, graphic that takes up most of the landing page. That landing page is valuable real estate. If you look at most successful communities, they don't have a big, um, big picture there that's taken up most of the space. They have interactions there. They have the latest discussion. A platform has to put the function of it above the form. It has to be focused on getting people to interact as quickly and as easily as possible. And you, you shouldn't be focused on the content here. You should be focused on the interactions. That's where the interactions should be. And Walmart Mom is another online community which, last time I checked, wasn't going that well. Um, and again, they have that big picture there. there there's nowhere that you can see instantly that shows you the latest discussions. There's nowhere you can see that um, show, show, shows you what you can do right now in the community. It's more of a content site, and brands tend to do that a lot. They tend to develop content sites instead of community sites. So, assuming that you've got the strong common interest and you picked a really simple pl platform that people know how to use, um, the next step is to start small. And another mistake that brands tend to make very often is that they will see on online communities like Mumsnet and um, uh, Barista Exchange and all these successful online communities and notice that they have a lot of members, that they have a lot of 
press releases, and they have um, a lot of ac activities and challenges and competitions going on. And they'll confuse the process with the end result. And they'll assume that for a community to be successful, it needs a lot of members, or it needs to be issuing press releases, or it needs a big push. And that's not the case. Every successful uh, big online community you see today began as a very small online community. I, and one of the things that you can do, if you like, is spend time looking through the any press release archive site for mentions of online communities, particularly where brands have said, we're going to launch an online community. And make sure they're dated about 12 months ago, and then see how successful that, that community has been. And I had found a single online community that started by a brand that issued a press release that actually succeeded. Most online communities, every online community, I believe, began as a small online community. They started with a small group, and then they grew, and they grew, and they grew from there. You don't need to rush it. I mean, in the beginning of an online community, you need to spend that time developing relationships with members. You need to forge that initial core group. You need to grow it slowly. And perhaps they tend to rush this. They tend to have a big promotional push. They try to get maybe 10,000 pe pe uh, people to register on, on the community in, in the first month. And then they report that figure, and they're fine. But registered members is an awful you know, assessment of whether their community is, is, is a success or not. People don't de delete, delete their accounts when they register. That number just keeps going up no matter what. And some of those members could be dead. You'd never know it. You know, half, half your community members could die in a horrific accident, and you just wouldn't know. And so if you're going to start a community, here's, here's what I recommend brands do. I'm not saying that most of them have done. And so here's what you should do, is that you should focus on building a list of 50 to 100 pe uh, people or customers or clients or friends, those that you can interact with online. And you should spend some time, and this is a full-time job, building relationships with them. You should be interacting with them um, every day, you should be asking them questions, you should be getting their opinion, and gradually you should be introducing them to each other. Now you, have, you can start with a mailing list for this, or you can use your platform for this, and you gradually bring more and more in. So you start with five, then you invite five more, so you 10, then you go 20, 50. And you need to focus on keeping them active. Because once you have a small online community, it's much easier to get a big online community. But you can't do that until you have a successful small online community. And brands, they're very tempted to skip that step. They're very, they think if they just throw a lot of people at it, that the community will take care of itself, and it never does. And all those examples we've seen so far, those have been from where brands have just thrown as much as they can at it, you know, competition, challenges, press releases, and it never works. So once you've got your group of 50 or so, what, what do you do then? Well, you can grow big, but it's not just about growing big, it's about growing big slowly. You need slow, steady growth to grow an online community. And so what do we mean by that? There are basically four channels of growth for an online community. You can directly invite um, those that you have some connection with to join their community. There's word of mouth activity from people that are already in their community. There's your promotional efforts. And, and there's surf, the people that tend to drift, to drift in. Those are basically the only four channels of growth you have for an online community. And so in the beginning, you can continue in inviting, directly inviting people to join your online community. You can spend time getting them engaged and involved in their community. You can continue growing it slowly. And if you focus on the members you have, then they will invite more members on your behalf. A lot of the successful online communities that we see today have never done any growth activity whatsoever. Months then, until I think about a year or so ago, never did anything to, to grow the online community. They just focused on making the community they have as fantastic as possible, and members just invited their friends and they got attention elsewhere. You didn't need to spend too much time on growth. And I think one of the things that brands tend not to do is have no plan for growth or providing members whatsoever. So they'll have a big event to get a lot of people to join the online community and fill out the registration process. But they won't have any plan for what's going to happen with those members a month from now. They won't have any plan for what, their, what the journey of that member is through the online community. They won't have any reminders at specific times when, they, when someone has made their first contribution to the community. Like One tactic I found that works really well is after a member makes a certain amount of contributions to a community, say five or ten uh, posts or topics or whatever, you, you can send them an email and tell them a little bit more about the community. You can send them an email about the community's history. You can tell, send them an, e an email about the top members of their community. And you reveal more and more about the community. And it drives people to participate more because they keep getting these, these updates that explain to them about the community. And there's a greater sense of community. People will start to feel a sense of ownership over that if you do that. 
So if you're going to grow from it, you need to grow slowly. You don't, need, you don't want any explosion of growth, but it's very hard to convert an explosion of growth into a sustained level of active members. You just need to keep it growing at a steady rate. And you can track that, and, and you can see how many people are joining, how many people are still active after three months. And by the way, if you have uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people that are joining the, the community, but the number of members is de that are active is decreasing each month, that's an issue. You don't need to worry about growing the community. You need to be keeping them active in the community itself. And so next, uh, something that a lot of brands tend to do when they start a community is they think that the content has to be about the broader topic. And that's not always the case, and I think that shouldn't be the case. Because when you start focusing on getting the latest news about the topic first, you become focused on the content side. And that puts you in competition with other content sites, the very sites that you want to help promote your own online community. And the best content for a community tends to be content about the community itself. And content should act as a local newspaper for the community. It should be something that gets people more involved. So if you look at what a, lo a local newspaper has, it's stories about people in the community. And this makes your news entirely unique from any other site out there. You can have interviews with your members, you can have um, updates about what people in your community have achieved, or what they're planning, or what's coming up. You should make the content entirely unique to your community itself. And so next, I mean, I took this picture from, um, sorry, I stole this picture from um, Speaker's Corner in Hyde, in Hyde Park a while ago. And I think, Speaker's Corner is one of these fascinating places where if you go there, you'll find people that get up on their soapbox and they'll, and they'll talk for an hour and they'll rant about whatever's on their mind. And people will walk past and tourists will stand for a few minutes and then they'll walk on. They might get a picture of them. But then there's another type of individual that tends to go there. And they will do almost the same thing. They'll get up on their soapbox, but then instead of ranting for an hour, they'll ask a question like, what do you think about benefits for unemployed? and someone will, 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 will respond, and someone else will respond to that. And they get a real discussion going. And the people that participate in those discussions stay for the entire time. And something I've noticed on three or four times that I've been there, people will stay for the entire time if you start discussions. And I think the same is true for communities as well, in my experience, that a lot of brands, they tend to focus on the discussions that, 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 that the discussions have to be about them, that their discussion has to be about the brand itself. And that's not the case. You don't. You want a branded on online community, perhaps, but you don't want branded com, uh, conversations. You want to be able to start interesting discussions that people can participate in. So you might ask them, you know, what is your favorite whatever, or what is your worst, or what's your best experience in this thing? Things that everyone can have an opinion in, things that everyone can participate in. And there's no shortage of interesting discussions you can have. And side note to this, I think it's absolutely fundamental.